I think, as everybody knows, CED is a nonpartisan, nonpolitical group. We are made up of 170 members who are roughly half D's and half R's, but you, you simply cannot come to Washington, and, and, and our CEOs love to come to Washington and hear about, you can't come without hearing some inside baseball. And so if I can invite our, our panelists uh, for the next panel up to the stage, um, we have an excellent lineup. Uh, including Michelle Cottle, who is our moderator. Michelle is the contributing editor to The Atlantic, which is one of the country's most esteemed magazines. Uh, our other panelists are Jonathan Allen, the head of the community and content, community and content at Sidewire. Here they come. Gene Cummings, the political editor of The Wall Street Journal. Charlie Hurt, columnist at The Washington Times. And Matt Schlapp, chairman of the American Conservative Union. Bob Walker, Executive Chairman of Wexler & Walker. So we've got both sides represented. These are the people that you see on television every night uh, commenting, and uh, I'm sure that they have wonderful uh, inside information for us on the, uh, the uh, w well, whatever the heck happened last week. Michelle, take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, so starting out here, just so you have a sense of, of where we're all coming from, who here, raise your hand, predicted the outcome of the election? Correctly, the winner? Yes, the winner. I got the winner. Anybody else? Okay, so you didn't predict it early enough because I've been on these panels early with you when during the primaries. So you're fudging it a little bit, Matt. I, look, I, got, it, I got it right in the last 72 hours. There you go. <laughs> Matt is on record. And that's better than it's most right. of us. It's so. Right. It's real. There you go. And, so, and, and, but I, I will say this. I did endorse him the day he announced. Is this working? No. It's not. No, we, we cut yours because of that, <laughs> actually. Yeah. So just you, so you know, like, if, as far as prognostication goes, you should take anything we say with a grain of salt. So. Yeah, I might have gotten it right in six hours. <laughs> <laughs> you knew when Florida went. It was yeah, all it was gone. over. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I guess the question on some level is what happened, and then where do we go from here? Gene, I'm going to toss you the what happened. Sure. Give me your, you know, give us your thumbnail take on it. Well, I think it came down to what every election comes down to, and that's turnout. And what was the surprise, even to the Trump campaign, was the level of turnout in the rural areas. Um, he basically, she basically hit many of her marks. Um, she, and eventually Michigan may still end up in her column, but she didn't hit all of her marks. So, but they, you know, they had set them, their targets based on the last election, you know, a Romney turnout, and it wasn't a Romney turnout. I mean, our expert on data said it best in that it was death by a thousand cuts. You know, she did great in Philadelphia, but then up in the small counties, and Bob can talk to this very well, you know, he, he would double what Romney had as turnout. And so that was the surprise of the night, is that there, he did energize people who had been pretty much sidelined for the last couple of presidential elections. And he energized them, and he got them out. And to the Trump campaign's benefit, that was their strategy. Uh, we found it interesting that uh, there were some late reports about how, you know, they they were described as voter suppression. But at any rate, it was that they won. They it was a nasty campaign in part to turn people off. Both sides participated in that. But then they were counting on his people being so activated that they would definitely show. And we noticed in North Carolina. He did three final rallies in the exact same location. So that was, you know, we looked at that like, what is it, just a big parking lot? You know, why would you just keep going back to the exact same arena? And that was all driven towards getting everybody in those rural counties around that big arena energized, excited, and out to vote. And they succeeded. I, so Bob, Jean made mention of turnout in the rural areas. This election has been in some way characterized as the revenge of the white working class. I mean, in what way do you think that's accurate? In what way do you think it's not? 
Well, I think what happened is that the, um, uh, that the Trump people early on had figured out back at, during the primary season that the country was divided uh, and that uh, on the um, uh, left side of that divide, if you will, uh, were, were all the Obama coalition. On the right side were the, um, uh, was a coalition that very few people were paying attention to. In, in the primaries, a lot of our candidates were uh, tacking toward the middle, the right center, but tacking toward the middle, looking toward the general election. Um, Donald Trump tacked toward the extremes of, uh, of, of that um, uh, right um, a division. Uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, uh, counted on some of the people toward the middle to be with him as well. Uh, that played out then in the general election as a very enthusiastic um, uh, portion of the electorate uh, that was going to stick with him and it didn't matter what he said or what he did, they were there, they were solid, and they were gonna, they were gonna stick with him through the whole uh, process. In Pennsylvania, that played itself out in all of these uh, rural areas uh, where uh, in some of those small towns you were seeing uh, 80 and 90 percent of the registered voters and some of those were newly registered voters. Many, many of them were uh, at least nominal Democrats uh, that, that turned out in, in, in those areas. Can, can I just say one so, thing? I think uh, a strange thing that happened, I'm breaking the rules here a little bit, I'll go fast though. The uh, strange thing that happened with the turnout in these rural communities, I don't think it's the revenge of the white voter because actually Trump did better in almost every category you look at. So actually it was a universally, universal improvement for Republicans and for Trump. But I really think you can get into the numbers and I've done it and it's fascinating, but you can also pull back and say, really, as you watch this election, is it surprising that people in rural America, is it surprising that working class voters, is it surprising that people who usually, as Hillary Clinton kept saying, who are cut out or there's, they're facing a stacked deck or Donald Trump would say, it's rigged, whatever terminology you want to use, uh, that they were more motivated. And I think uh, two things happened. First thing is, when she said deplorables, that was a disaster. It's one thing to attack your opponent, it's another thing to attack the people that support that candidate. That was a real, it was hard for her to ever stop the bleeding on that. And that was something that when I went around the country, I heard from people just organically. They just felt judged by the other candidate. And then the second thing were those Obama letters, those Obamacare letters. I tell you, I've done some devious direct mail in my day. There's not a direct mail person who could have come up with a better mailing to happen in the end of a campaign from the government, by the way, that was official, that really kind of knocked her block off. <laughs> All right, so Charlie, I, I'm sure you're hearing from a lot of Republicans who are understandably elated about kind of the turn out across, across, <laughs> across the board. I mean, yeah. not just the top of the ticket, but I mean, they thoroughly expected to lose the Senate and lose more than they did in the House, at least the ones I've talked to. So, but what concerns are you hearing? Because he's not a conventional Republican. He did not run on conservative ideology. Where do you see the potential cracks forming? Well, uh, that is absolutely the biggest concern that you hear from conservatives is that, you know, he's not, and, and I, I heard it all through the primary, uh, but he's not a real conservative. And it's like, exactly, that's, you know, we we went with the, 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 you know, the doctrinaire conservative route, and what did it get us? It got us the largest expansion of Medicare in the history of the program, and then, and then they lost everything, and it got Obamacare. So let's try something different for a change. Maybe that will help, uh, cons you know, conservatives or Republicans. Um, <clears throat> And I, I, I think that the, you know, the, the seeds of this election were, were in a lot of ways sown in the uh, 08 election. Uh, President Obama has been a very successful politician if getting reelected is the only metric. If you look at other things, I mean, you know, he came in, he had a full, you know, he had all the controls of power in terms of the House and the Senate, and he passed through some stuff that, as Matt said, turned out to be hugely unpopular. He won re-election, but he cost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Democratic, uh, of Democratic seats in uh, the House, Senate, uh, legislatures, governorships. And in that way, he, I, I, he's decimated his party. And it's based, based on his ideas. And he remains a very popular guy. He's an appealing guy. I don't agree with anything he says, but I find it hard not to like him. Um, I think he's funny, and, and you know I like that he's cool. I, I, actually, he's he's done a good job of uh, actually straining some of that with me. But um, but I, so the idea that that eight years later you would have these anti-establishment winds blowing 
and uh, and and you have this guy that came out of nowhere, or not, not who has no political experience, and he's a showman. He he has the he has this wonderful ear for the sort of uh, absurd, and, and he's hysterical. I mean, he's so fun. People don't give him credit for how funny he is, and he's in it. He's in on most of the jokes that people you know, tell about him. And he just had that perfect connection. And what, and what I was saying earlier is, and maybe this says more about me as a de deplorable, but literally, the day, I, I had, it was a Wednesday, June 16th. Uh, last year, I was sitting in my office. I just filed my no Tuesday. It was a Tuesday because, and I just filed my column for, with the paper. And he comes down his escalator with Melania behind him, and he gave that speech. And it was about work, uh, and it was about I mean everything that he said. He hit on everything that mattered. And I literally called up the paper and I was like, uh, uh, you know, hold the presses. I'm going to file another column and endorse this guy. Um, and and I think uh, uh, one last thing that I would say is that um, the, the election turned on the number of voters and counties out there who voted for, Donald, uh, voted for Barack Obama twice and then voted for Donald Trump. And, and when they voted for uh, Barack Obama, it was because they were, they were scared, they were, uh, felt vulnerable, and they wanted the government to take care of them. Eight years later, They've given up hope that the government can take care of them. They just want a job. They want to take care of themselves. And that was what the vote for Donald Trump was this time, I think. All right. So, John, what are you hearing from Democrats in terms of how, how do they deal with this? <laughs> do, they, do they even know? <laughs> That's, there you go. Is there, is there, do I need to do anything with this? Are you on? Am I on? No. Sorry. You got to yell, John. I'm just going to wave to tell you what the Democrats are doing. <laughs> Um, you know, what I'm hearing from, the, is that better? It's still not working. Bob, here. Here, here, here. Thank you. Is that better? All right, sorry. Oh, there you go. Wow. Um, so, it's symbolic. Uh, the Democrats are so lost right now. There's a Yiddish word, uh, fablungit. It means you're so lost you don't know how lost you are. And that's where they are. The Senate Democrats got together today. And they put together a leadership team, and there are 10 members of the Democratic leadership now in the Senate out of fewer than 50 total members. Um, there are any number of people jumping into the Democratic National Committee race right now. In some ways, I think they are probably overreacting a little bit to their loss. I mean, if you look at, historically speaking, this is still a pretty close election. I don't just mean in terms of the popular vote, which it looks like Clinton will win, but in terms of the Electoral College. This isn't like a 1984 wipeout of like 525 to 13. This was a surprise. It was a shock to them. They felt like they'd built uh, an impenetrable blue wall of largely uh, minorities and upper class whites and liberals that, you know, liberal whites across the spectrum and women, and they were like, we can't lose. So they were shocked by that, and I think they're reacting to that in a, in a kind of stunned way, and they will probably overreact to it in some way. Um, but, uh, but in terms of where they look for leadership next, I think there's, there's sort of two schools of thought. One is go get um, a genuine liberal to be the face of the party. Uh, whether you're talking about a Keith Ellison, maybe, um, congressman from Minnesota, the first Muslim congressman, I believe, uh, and or you're talking about, uh, on the other side, this sort of, we need to get somebody who's a white working class kind of congressman or, uh, or face to go out and compete with Donald Trump in those areas. And my argument is that those two things aren't necessarily different from each other. I think what Trump understood so successfully in this election was if he went at the upper Midwest, if he went at the Rust Belt, uh, and campaigned there hard for these votes, they were available to him, and the rest of the Republicans would come home and show up. Uh, whereas the Democrats were like, whatever, we're gonna be fine with you know Cleveland and Philadelphia and Milwaukee, um, at any rate. Well, I, I agree with you, John, that they'll probably overreact. But let's, let's just look at, at this election more broadly. He could not have been more, better placed as the change candidate. And she could not have been the worst. You know, the, everyone said in the beginning, this is a change election. And he took out 17 Republicans who ha had a lot of titles in front of their names. 
she managed to go toe to toe with him in this kind of environment, which is not so bad, and one reason that the Democrats probably shouldn't should recognize that they do have the coalition of the future. The coalition of the future is uh, diverse. And there isn't a single Republican, I think, who was on the primary stage who could have produced that kind of turnout. He's a singular candidate, I believe. And so, and he was of the moment, absolutely of the moment. And to his credit, his instincts told him that. And so I think that it could be that there will be another Donald Trump, you know, that comes behind him and that can sustain the coalition that he brought out. I don't know who that person is and I don't think we've met them. Um, but someone could rise to do that. But if you sort of step away from the surprise, agreed, um, and you just look at, you know, the what typically happens, what the normal patterns are, I don't know if it, if it can be sustained. So that's where I think the danger to the Democrats in overreacting is, was this a singular event or do they have systemic problems? I think they've probably, I think it's a mix. I think her messaging was wrong, her, her resume was wrong, so they had, you know, some of their own problems that they didn't recognize early. She did an amazing job, too, of losing in the same construct that she did in 2008 of change versus experience yes. and didn't figure out how to make a change argument or maybe felt that it was too much gall to suggest that she could come in and reform Washington. I mean, Trump was like, I know how this place works. It's corrupt. I've corrupted some of these guys. I'm going to change it. <laughs> People were like, great, he's going to go in and the fox in the house or whatever. And I mean, she never made any effort to say, here's my reform agenda. I remember the day he dropped what essentially, and, and Congressman, uh, my apologies for attributing this to Newt Gingrich and not you, but he essentially dropped Newt Gingrich's 1995 reform plan and, and you know, said, here's what I'm gonna do in the first 100 days. I remember when he dropped that and I thought to myself, why didn't she do this like six months ago? Why is it taking so, you know, why, why is there nothing on her side that says I'm a change candidate? Because he right. probably would have mocked her and then everybody would have laughed at her. Yeah, that's, I think that's a problem. But I, but I guess my view is it's better to try and be mocked for that than to not try at all. And she didn't make any effort to say she could bring any form of change. I mean, it was like, I'll be Barack Obama like, a little bit on steroids but or a little we're forgetting, bit less. I think what we're forgetting is, is that there was a certain, these campaigns got into certain ruts or on certain paths, and she was going to win. She was going to win. So why would you be, why would you change and try to be clever? You didn't need to. She was going to win. The poll showed she was going to win. Everyone who went through the demographic analysis, how can you win if you don't get this much of women's support? How are you going to win if you don't get this much of college age support? And I'd always say back then when they went through all of that, I would say, well, now let's go through the national polls and these state polls, and you, there, you actually can win under the scenario because maybe, just maybe, there will be people who will vote who don't normally vote. Maybe there are people who are inspired by what they're hearing or agitated, whatever the word, and maybe, just maybe, uh, there is this kind of quiet Trump support, which I think turned out to be true. Now, here's the question, though. He won by being, I think, Gene is correct, kind of a singular phenomenon. There is no politician out there who could have gotten away with making the wild promises, not to mention the personal screw-ups that he did. And it was all, he was like he was coated in Teflon. But, so, you, but you say that now, before it was like, for all those reasons, there's no way he can get there. Now we're looking back and saying is, well, all those things were virtue and it's the only reason. No, 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 I'm not saying those were virtue. Th those weren't a virtue. Well, they were I'm just saying no one to me, I mean. Grab them by the pussy is not a virtue, fair Matt. Right, what I'm saying is no one cared. They're like, when I would talk to women, they're like, yeah. oh, you know, he says that stuff, but he's a reality TV guy, he doesn't really mean it, right. or he means it, but it doesn't matter, I'm willing to take a risk, which nobody else could have gotten away with. But it's one thing to get the job, now what are you worried about in terms of doing the job? This is what I want to know from, you know, You're the, the, the pro-Trump pro -Trump team on some level even acknowledges that it's a very scary place to be. Yeah, so I, you know, I was on the 2000 campaign for Bush. I was on the transition. 
I was the guy in the political operation who oversaw the personnel process, uh, and I was there the whole first term. And the fact is it's a very debilitating job. Things hit your desk you never thought would hit your desk. I mean, the idea that George Bush, who was going to be the education president, turned out spending his whole first term talking about terrorism. Uh, he never thought in a million years he'd be talking about things like gay marriage. Uh, things happen that you don't anticipate happening. So uh, do I worry about how they'll handle these challenges? Absolutely. It's a big job. It's the most complicated job in the world. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very sobering. I remember in 19... 92 when George H.W. Bush won the presidency and I, I was in college then and had been an activist for him on my campus and uh, and he came out that night and gave one of the most sobering uninspiring speeches and you could just tell this was a person who understood yay I won Ugh, I won <laughs> and there's a little bit of that with the Trump people too it's like this is amazing we won and there's also a little bit like okay it starts to set in on you. It's a big job. So what do you think, Bob, do you think is his big well, I, risk here? Well, no, I think, look, I think, I think he's a fairly unique um, uh, figure in the presidency because I'm not certain that he wants to do the presidency the way we expect him to do the presidency. Um, I think that he's about to make um, Mike Pence into a prime minister who will run the government day to day. I think you're seeing in the transition team a switch to do that. And as um, uh, Donald Trump, um, uh, or Donald Trump Jr. told John Kasich when they called him to be uh, uh, considered for vice president, uh, he said, uh, well, you understand as vice president, you would be running both the domestic and the foreign policy for the country. And John said, well, what your, is your father going to do? And the answer was, he's going to make the country great again. Well, let me tell you how that works out. Um, uh, on Capitol Hill, one of the big problems that the Republicans has is a whole group of um, the Freedom Caucus guys and so on who uh, don't go along with um, uh, the uh, majority of their party on issues. Now the President of the United States is going to be pushing that agenda. If he calls those people into a room, what he will say to them is, guys, I don't care. If you want to go against me, you can go against me. But understand, three days from now, Air Force One is going to show up in your district. I'm going to have 30,000 people you know, to, in a, an auditorium in your district or in uh, some uh, stadium in your district, and I'm going to tell them that you are personally keeping me from becoming, uh, making the country great again. And I got to tell you, I served one of the safest districts in the Congress when I was there. If that happened, and those people were activated enough to begin contacting me, that would be a very scary prospect. Except uh, it's not the Freedom Caucus where his problems make oh, arise. It's a, it, it is going to be the it's Freedom Caucus. It's going to be both sides. Because right now, I mean, one of the really fascinating things to watch, you know, from especially, you know, for an outlet like the Wall Street Journal, is Paul Ryan's writing a budget. And he is, he is uh, obviously a big <clears throat> fan of entitlement reform. And Donald Trump made a promise on the campaign that he was not going to do that. So those are going to be the areas where I think it will be most fascinating to see what the new president does and how Paul Ryan manages that. Because um, those, are, those are really substantial things that affect people's lives. We went to, I sent two reporters into the Trumpiest county in Virginia. <laughs> And it's, um, that would be Charlie's home. That, that, that be, <laughs> they don't call it Buchanan; they call it Buckcannon. Um, right. It's way, way down, down near Tennessee. And we did the demographics on the county. It's you know Appalachia, so it's poor, it's old, and everybody is on some kind of government health program. I mean, almost everybody in the county. So Trump called it a contract that that's what Social Security is, that's what health services are with their government. That was a pretty profound promise. And so from my perspective, that's where you, really the rubber meets the road in terms of how we see this administration interact with Congress. And in that case, he's not against the Freedom Caucus, no, he's the, against the, the establishment. Uh, Gene, I would agree with that. The, 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 I was using that as an example, though, of one of the things that, that, that has been a problem for the people on the Hill. Look, Donald Trump doesn't know anybody anything. I mean, he's, he's, he's unique in that that, 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 that there is no part of the party. And so if it turns out that it is the 
um, establishment part of the party that's opposing him, he'll have no uh, qualms about going out and, and calling them out on it uh, either. Uh, so uh, th this, is, this is, I think, a power that is uh, pretty unique. Um, I think that can go both ways. I mean, I think what, what we're looking at here right now is him not being beholden to anyone and not really having big relationships inside the party could go very well. It allows him to potentially create new coalitions. It also could go completely sideways because if he starts falling in popularity, people will abandon him very quickly. Um, I think what Gene's saying is fascinating about uh, about the entitlements in particular because two things. Number one, it means Trump learned something from George W. Bush who said he wanted to go after Social Security and then found that essentially the evangelical support base that he had didn't like the idea of private Social Security account. It was all through the South. And Remember that that was a second term agenda item, which is really important here, which is it's how you stack it, right? So I used to roll my eyes at the, okay, what do they roll out first question? So do you do entitlements and does Trump say, okay, we're gonna do a big budget deal that actually tackles entitlements or do we not? What you go with first, uh, really does matter because presidential capital starts high, maybe much different from a CEO, but it starts high and it ebbs with every second that goes by. At least that's our modern understanding of it. And you're exactly right. As soon as right. there's jitters in the popularity uh, numbers and everything else, your capital. Just so he's been talking. Here's he's been talking infrastructure, and rolling back Obamacare, and taxes. What? do you think is going to be doable? The big, the big fight right now I know on, with, with Hill leadership is do they do Obamacare first and taxes first? I think the Hill is more prone to want to do Obamacare first because that's such a pronounced part of our politics for the last eight years. But there are others that are say we should do taxes and first. And if There's you wander into Obamacare, though, that gets pretty complicated because he's already said he's not repealing it. He's going to whittle away at it. And if he doesn't replace it, so then you're yeah, asking is, them to this, dive this, in pretty early, Look, right? this is the big problem we got with Trump in the whole election, which is he uses these words that are not precise, right? And, uh, and so he said, well, we're going to keep some of it. Well, this is Republican orthodoxy, which is we can't roll back pre-existing conditions. I don't think there's anybody in Congress who's advocating for that. So whether you keep the Obama language on pre-existing conditions or repeal the bill and come up with our own version of what that is, that's going to remain in whatever goes forward. There are other things that remain in what goes forward as well. But the, the main thrust of what, the main premise of Obamacare, which is basically forcing people to buy health insurance, it was all about health insurance, it's important to remember, in a particular way, I, you know, I think that's going to be gone. But I think, the, um, I think one of the issues that we're going to see rise up is what is it that you can get both chambers of Republicans to agree on in a budget? Because you the vehicle that you need, and I don't want to get terribly technical, but the vehicle need you, to, you need to do this is called reconciliation. Otherwise, the Democrats can filibuster. Reconciliation is produced by a, bu that process is produced by a gr budget agreement between the two chambers. So if they're talking, about, if there's somebody that wants to, if Paul Ryan wants to change Medicare, uh, he's only going to be able to do that through reconciliation, which is also the vehicle for repeal and replace Obamacare, which is also the vehicle Parts of it. For, t for taxes. Right, but my point being, there are a lot of, the more you start to stick into that one process that you have, the more difficult I think it becomes to keep people together on it. And, and in terms of the precision of language, the other day Kellyanne Conway, who's I know smart enough to know what she was saying was kind of ridiculous, got up and said, we're going to call a special sec session of Congress on Inauguration Day and repeal and replace Obamacare. And I'm like, Congress is already in session on Inauguration Day. That's how you have an inauguration. That's how they use the premises. Oh, Charlie details, knows. John, I, details. But I, mean, but, I, but I do think at some point they are going to have to start using language that is well, realistic. That's, that's my next question. But, but, well, do but, they? But just, just to make the point, they are setting up a scenario where they're going to have two bites at the reconciliation uh, apple. Uh, they're setting up a, 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 a reconciliation package that will probably pass in December, and then they will pass another one can I, next I, year. And so. Bob, can I just say, the importance of this is we don't have to get the 60 votes, right? So the, the importance of this is it's a majority vote, and the Republicans have the majority. So it can go on party line. But can I say one thing about, um, you know, Republicans are, and the media, everybody is like freaking out because of this <laughs> discord uh, between Trump and Republicans in the party. And, and I get it. But over the past 30 years, and this is the fault of both Democrats and Republicans, uh, Congress has um, ha has worked to, uh, you know, r r eviscerate its own authority, its own power, and hand power over to the executive branch. Democrats have done it the past eight years. Before that, uh, Republicans 
did it even worse with uh, George W. Bush. And the result is a, a very weakened legislature. Um, the idea that we have a, pre a Republican president in the White House and then a Republican House and Senate in down Pennsylvania Avenue, and they're openly in open disagreement about things, is a fantastic thing. And that is exactly what the, the, the founders intended. They wanted both, they wanted the president and they wanted Congress to jealously guard their turf and guard their power in order to keep a check on one another. And, and so, you know, people get upset about it. I don't care. I mean, obviously I want uh, the most conservative, I, I guess I do, the most conservative thing, although a lot of what the conservatives come up with uh, kind of stinks, but, but I guess I want the most conservative thing, but I don't really care. It, this is working. You have Trump and Paul Ryan in an open warfare over uh, legislation, get it all out there, work out the details, and then pass something. Something Bob, that Bob, it's spoken like a journalist, <laughs> not by a <laughs> legislator. Well, like, well, 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 except, yeah, but except that Trump sees everything in terms of making deals. Uh, you know, yeah. un unlike most politicians uh, who who see things as as the end game of what is politically salient, he sees things in terms of making deals, uh, and and he's not going to care who he deals with. He's going, you know, if he can make a deal with Chuck Schumer. He'll make a deal with Chuck Schumer. He's already called him. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't want. I, I, I don't want people that I don't agree with to have any influence over this whatsoever. But that's not how it works. No, precisely. No, I, yeah. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. But I'm also <laughs> saying to you that that uh, that you've got you've got in Donald Trump a uh, a person who doesn't view this the way we have traditionally viewed the whole uh, political system. Uh, that uh, this is a guy who who really does see uh, the opportunity to make a deal, and if, if he has to go to the extreme and work toward the middle to make his deal, he'll do that. All right, on that happy note, we're going to stop and throw this out to the audience for questions. There, right up front. Thank you. It's still Paula Stern, and still with CED. Um, my question um, is that uh, these folks who uh, uh, came out and voted for, for uh, President-elect Trump um, thought uh, that at least there were two issues that he had started with and never kind of s stepped back from. Trade and immigration. And so far I haven't heard y'all talk about that at all. Um, and you, you talked about what his priorities were, get rid of Obamacare is what you said, and I won't repeat what everyone else said because it's all recorded. I'd like you, however, to uh, tell us um, whether um, one of his first acts, why one of his first acts will not be, I'm renegotiating the NAFTA, Canada's ready, Mexico's ready, they, it's a 25-year-old thing. Let's, you know, that was one of the things I said I was going to do on day one, if not day 100. Um, let's talk about some of the thing, that some of these other issues as well, please. Well, TPP is thought to be dead. Well, I didn't say TPP. I but said NAFTA, NAFTA and you, you get into the question of free trade, you're wading into territory that is going to bring huge clashes with the Republican Congress and Senate. Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, and those folks, they're not populist. They are not looking to put up protectionist barriers. They're not looking to trash the whole free trade system or even really change it that much. So Trump needs to do that when he's ready for bloodshed. Well, that actually, though, is one of the things that he could do early. Um, and he, he's, he has changed his language. Um, one of the things I find hard is that sometimes I think I just don't even know who we elected because he, you know, he's changed his language already on so many different things. But he, didn't, he started changing his language on trade though before election day where he was saying, I'm, I support trade, I just want to renegotiate. And opening up a new negotiation over NAFTA is something that Ryan and McConnell may not be against because it's not saying we're not going to have trade, we're going to do it differently. That is something he has executive authority over so he can act more quickly on. So, you know, that is one that would be there for him. The, the immigration, I think you'll see them start with enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he said this 
two to three million criminals he's going to get rid of. You know, we're, we're exploring this, but that's just an extension of Obama's policy. Obama already has like two million people teed up to be deported who have been convicted of crimes. So that isn't much of a, an extension of a promise, but he could deliver it because, you know, they've got the, they've got the people there to throw out. Um, so I think he'd start on enforcement. When it comes to the wall, We've seen his language change. He's talking about maybe a little fence here or there or whatever. But I mean, the whole, the whole wall thing is just enormously complicated. And you know, right down to, at the moment, today, who owns the land? And how do you get the land? I mean, there's just, it, 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 leaving aside who's gonna pay for it, there's, there are no renderings, it, you know? I mean, it's making just, Mexico pay for it is probably the easiest part of that. Yeah, right. Exactly. The, the, uh, yeah, I would just say on both of these, which is on the NAFTA piece, if you really talk to the people, and there's probably people in this room who are really involved in NAFTA, they will all admit, even the Republicans, that they were supposed to be follow on agreements, that the deal was never really fully uh, negotiated. And it was so, they were so happy to get it passed. They were just like, we don't want to keep going into the briar patch. So I think that's actually a real question that uh, his legal team is looking at. Okay, what are the things that happen? Because he's going to burn about a thousand executive actions in the Oval Office fireplace in the first day. And, you know, how much of that can take care of some of these questions? I think on the question of Article One, back to what, uh, my colleagues were saying earlier, I think that gets to this question of what do we do on immigration. George W. Bush and Barack Obama, Barack Obama was called the, uh, what did they call it, something, deporter. In, deporter in chief. George W. Bush, you know, they doubled uh, the budgets in some cases on enforcement. So this is a trajectory that we're on, but I do think this, it would be much better if Congress, with a bipartisan uh, effort in the Senate, worked through what an enforcement, enforcement alone, what enforcement look like, and I think that'll be good for the country if we do just, that. Just one other comment on the trade side. Uh, I think what we are learning, uh, based upon what people said during the campaign, is that multilateral deals do not work. That the, that the problem is that uh, you can't enforce them. You have so many people, that, and you have to go to courts, and by the time the courts make a decision that somebody has behaved badly, uh, the business that was affected is out of business. And so my guess is that one of the ways in which we stay vital in uh, global trade is to begin to do m far more in the way of bilateral deals instead of multi. And Bob, you remember, I don't know if you were there then, but remember when Reagan, he used some tools at his disposal when there were unfair trade practices. And I think you're gonna see Trump try to use some tools and some people will say, oh, that's not consistent with conservative philosophy, but we have to be careful what we call free trade, right? It needs to be reciprocated. Well, he's it, not been entirely careful about what he's promised. I mean, he's promised to, to smack down China on a lot of issues. Yes. So what you have to wait and China. see is... That's right, China. <laughs> you have to wait and see kind of what, what he means. And this speaks to Jean's, you know, she doesn't know who we've elected. I don't think anybody knows who we've elected. If you kind of so, talk to either team, whether Republican legislators, Democrats who are, you know, home in the prenatal pretzel under the bed, they just have no idea who he is, what he's going to try, what he stands well, look, for. So I think this kind of gets at your point, though. And I, there's a columnist, Selena Zito, who's a fantastic, awesome, uh, wonderful writer, who tweeted something the other day that may have been the tweet of 2016, which was that journalists take Donald Trump literally but not seriously, and voters take him seriously but not literally. That's Peter Thiel's favorite quote as well. Is it? He also, yeah. So, I mean, I think that helps explain a little bit of this. And in terms of the campaign itself, um, Donald Trump offered a very clear, easy to follow, bold, bright colored vision for what he was going to do for America, what his priorities were in terms of the wall, in terms of undoing trade deals. Uh, and some, jobs. He said jobs all the time. And said jobs all the time. All the time. And Hillary Clinton said, I have a policy for everything. And if you believe in everything, you believe in nothing. If you were prioritizing everything, you were prioritizing she nothing. She also said things were pretty good because she didn't run against the Obama agenda, which didn't was discordant with this huge percentage of voters who think we're on the wrong track. I think she may have misinterpreted his personal popularity, like Charlie yeah. likes him for, pop, for his agenda being approved right. of. Totally. What? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that... Um, There's a delta. Yeah. But, you know... You know <laughs> the, here's, a, here's a question. Is there a certain point at which he's not going to bring back the coal industry? 
he's not going to build a huge wall. Does that matter? You're I mean, they didn't a, you're take You're such him. a naysayer. Yeah. So, well, but how about he makes it better? No, the, the, I'm how sure about he's going to make America but how about great things, again. But how about I'm things, confident. How about, but, thing, how about the economy gets better? But the, the tri- Exactly. Yeah, the tri- if he does that broadly, does it matter that he doesn't build that wall? The, 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 this whole thing, the, the trade thing um, is uh, such a vital part of this to the point where if you, at his rallies, pe- it, from the audience, like he'd be rambling on about something for 30 minutes and then finally from the audience, like, you know, the, the people would go, China, China, just to get him to start talking about China. It was like, 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 like an audience at, Free, you know, at, at a Leonard Skinner concert going, Freebird, China, and then he'd start talking about China. And, it, and they would love it. Um, but the trade thing is vital. You know, and, and, and the thing with Donald Trump is, he is the master of imprecise language, but he's also, he's very illustrative. He uses very illustrative words. And so he uses the word wall. And he uses the word, you know... Smack China yeah, down with yeah, a trade war. Yeah, all of those things. And, um, and I, I, don't, I really don't think that, uh, A, his supporters necessarily believe all of that literally. Uh, what they believe, though, is that he is serious about um, about protecting American jobs and generating American jobs, and that's why you know going through and doing things you know with the EPA and do, you know cutting regulation, do, doing the sorts of things that we know kill jobs. That that will be part of fulfilling his his promise about about uh, um, about going after China. The other and, and then in terms with, with the wall, um, you know, he he is he's a master negotiator. He's very good at it, and what he and he knows that you have to start with the hardest position there is, and that is you build a concrete wall of China. Or not, I don't mean to say that the word. Great wall of China. Great wall of somewhere. Yeah, uh, the uh, great wall a with beautiful a big, wall. beautiful door in it. Beautiful. And you start there, and you're deporting everybody, and then you you don't negotiate against yourself. You start there, and then and then you, you know if you lose certain things and you get rid of the people that are criminals beyond just being illegal aliens, and you and you have a fence in places and not a wall. It, all that doesn't, that's fine. People will be happy with that. Um, what they're tired of, what they cannot stand are these images of tens of thousands of, of people and children being drawn to the border because they all believe that Barack Obama is going to just give them all amnesty and let them come into the country. And, and, and not only is that not good for us as a country, but what, what about those people? And what about those children that get mauled and raped coming to, coming across Mexico to come into a false promise that that in this country? And so, if that stops, and then and then something reasonable is done with the illegals that are here now, I think I don't think that his supporters are going to hold that against him and say, "Well, you didn't build the wall." Well, if you look, if you look at uh, the parts of the border already, we have those big walls uh, yes. that that we've built. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Donald Trump within a few days after he's inaugurated go down and throw the first shovel full of dirt uh, to build, uh, you know, another uh, concrete barrier uh, and then uh, look at uh, what can be done in terms of a virtual wall and fences and so on uh, as the administration rolls out. And so, remember uh, the... Uh, wait, wait, wait. We have all of those things. <laughs> we already have, we have drones, we have patrols, we have fences, we have monitors, we have wall. We have all of those things in place, but we also do not have our thousands of people pouring over those. Immigration from the South is down. Because not of the up. economy. It's not that's, because we have negative immigration right now. Saying, they're not yeah. there. We need, to, we need to build a wall to keep them in now. As, as I said, the, <laughs> the Obama economy was so weak that even immigrants coming over the southern border stopped coming. All right, let's, let's take another question out here before this gets out of control. Right there. <laughs> Uh, my name is Klaus von Zastra. I'm with Change the Equation. Uh, one big issue right now is that um, racial and ethnic uh, minorities are feeling anxious. And uh, I think they're going to be looking to see whether they have an advocate in um, the administration and whether they have a protector. And so how might this play out? Who wants that one? I I'll start with it. I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't think they're anxious. I think they're, they're really, really scared. Yeah. They're very scared. Um, and, I, and Donald Trump hasn't spoken to the American public yet in, in a, you know, a very public way. In, in the 60 Minutes interview, he urged supporters, you know, not to, uh, pro, you know, do anything to minorities and to stop uh, in any way frightening them or intimidating them, because we've had some incidents of it. But 
it's really incumbent on him to step up more and show really strong leadership because, like I said, I don't pretend to know who Donald Trump is. But um, I also, because I don't know who he is, I'm not going to assume that he's in any way a racist. I have no reason to believe that. Probably more reason not to believe it. So he needs to step up and really show some strong leadership here because it's a, it, it, these people are genuinely scared. I think um, terrified is, is even a better word. Um, I think from, and look, this comes from his supporters, right? So to judge Donald Trump on this alone, I think is, is wrong. But uh, if you look at the stuff, the anti-Semitic stuff that goes on in social media, my friends who've had things mailed to their homes uh, after their, their addresses were um, doxed by supporters, if you look at all that stuff that's been going on for a long time, uh, and you look at some of the things that have been said in this campaign, uh, I think the question isn't necessarily, is Donald Trump going to come out and like resegregate the country or something? Like, of course not. Uh, but I think that the fear from people Politicians is, do that for him. I'm sorry? Uh, the, the, the whole, uh, who started this, but the, the entire, whether it's the media or politicians, they divide America into race and gender. They, it's the, it is the only industry in America where racial profiling is not only accepted, it's encouraged. It's, it's, it, if you, both parties have armies of demographers. What do we need demographers for? Why are we, si se puede, why are, why are we tailoring messages for different racial groups? We're supposed to be, this is a, a nation of ideas. The debate should be about ideas, things that help everybody, no matter what your race, creed, or color, anything. And, and, and the fact that politicians have racialized everything about politics in this country, I, I, I hope, I, I hope the one thing that, we, that happens out of this election is that pollsters, politicians, media, everybody stops talking about all this nonsense. So can I, if, if I could just finish the thought here. Sorry. I think what the fear is, is that there will not be enforcement. That if you have uh, all of this emboldening of white nationalist groups, and, and, and there is an emboldening of white nationalist groups, if you look at the Stormfront folks, and if you look at the willingness of people to go out and embrace white, like, not that there weren't white nationalists before, but the, oh, inc were. the emboldening and the encouragement or the willingness of people to come out and say it and say, this is what I believe, uh, I, think that's, I think that's something that is scary to people who are not white and who are not privileged and who, uh, who have looked at the government for a long time to protect them uh, from, from violence, from intimidation. Um, and so I think that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest, most realistic concern. And when, when Trump's first move is to hire a guy into the White House who, um, who at least tickles the fancy of that white nationalist. I can sit set. here and trash uh, President Obama's uh, speeches, the press conferences he gave. Okay, and, and they're arrogant, they're clueless. He's delusional. I think he's he's you know, I, I, you know he, he's spiking the football after he just lost the game. I, I, if I said all of those things, I'm sure that some racist a hole somewhere would be like, oh, that's great. I'm so glad he said it. That doesn't that doesn't impugn me. I don't. I, I, I hate these people. I don't. I don't know I, who's David Duke. I wouldn't know except CNN keeps talking about him. He has no following. Ignore him. The, 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 this, they are so far. You know, it's like Abraham Lincoln said. You know, make it unfashionable. You know what? It's become unfashionable. And and. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's right. I think it's become more fashionable over the course of this campaign. Can I can I, can I jump in here? That's what I think po the concern is. Politically, we keep talking about. First of all, I think on the race front, uh, it makes me uncomfortable. I think we talked a lot about race in this election. I think we talked so much about trying to judge each other's morality and what their, and w what their approach was. And we didn't ask them questions like, hey, are you going to ask the Supreme Court to overturn gay marriage? Hey, what's your Obamacare fix? We talked about all these other things. We talked about them so much. And if you think about this, all the political smart people on TV keep telling all these voters, maybe they're white voters, however we want to describe them, Christian voters, however we want to say it, which is you're on the losing end of the stick demographically. Uh, it's all about the new Americans. It's all about the diverse Americans. It's all about the diverse American. I think, I think we ought to give that a rest too. How about this? I like what Charlie said about ideas, which is there was a point in this country not very many decades ago where women voted very similarly to how men voted. 
And there was even a period of time where blacks were very diverse in their political opinions. Martin Luther King Sr. and Jackie Robinson were Republicans. Now, Republicans made errors and lost that vote, which I think is a tragedy. But if you actually look at this along our divisions, we actually had periods of time where there was much less divisions across these questions of race, ethnicity, and everything else. And I do think all the adults in the room eventually, we should just be talking about how